20th Ward only issued two tax abatements this last year, um, whereas uh, many other wards issued a lot more. Uh, tax abatement <coughs> is a tool that allows developers to bridge the gap between what it costs to develop a property and what it might be worth in the current community and the climate of that economic uh, nature of that community. In the 20th Ward, we do have a big gap. Unfortunately, our fully renovated houses aren't worth the same as they are in other parts of the city. So we need tax abatement to make to encourage uh, developers to come down here and to give them a financial incentive to do so. I think that in the 20th Ward, we should uh, have more than we have in other wards. In fact, we have less. I don't know where the two came from. I'm sure I did that in one meeting. We did the two tax abatements, so there have been more than that. I, I didn't really remember that with me. Uh, I would also indicate that LRA is basically a placeholder. They are not designed unless you want to pay more taxes to keep the buildings up, but they are placeholder. They're not the city of St. Louis. What I did creatively is take 33 of those buildings out of LRA's hands. We got some of these buildings from foreclosures so that we can, can have developers come in and they can redevelop these properties with um, tax, uh, tax credits. Um, you know, uh, tax abatement, yes. Well, you know, you shouldn't give tax abatement unless those properties would not otherwise be developed. And so there may be projects from time to time when I think the city of St. Louis that that happens. It is not happening in the 20th Ward that we are doing it to impact our schools negatively. In fact, we need more tax abatement uh, and we'll give it whenever we can for these wonderful projects that come in. Ask for clarification. Am I just allowed to ask a question? And, and we suggest if you, if you uh, want to add more information, you do it in closing remarks. No, am I allowed to ask a question? Right. No, we don't do that. Okay. Sorry, Beth. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move away from land for the minute. We'll get back to uh, some of these issues and some money, but we're going to go to another hot topic. Police and firefighter pensions. And this, I believe, is Mr. Schiffer's. What is your position on police and firefighter pension reform? Well, I support reform. Unfortunately, uh, we have no ability to reform the police pensions at all. That's strictly by the state. And um, the uh, courts have indicated that we were correct, that we do have the ability to have local control over the firefighter pension. We want to make sure that they have a really good uh, vital pension, but going forward, we need to make sure that um, those pension benefits are determined locally and by all of us and not by somebody in the other city. Does that make any clarification on that? This is really talking about the way the law works in the city. Oh, sure. So, um, you know, our our firefighters and our police force, they, they serve us. You know, they are the people that come. You know, our firefighters are our first responders in the times of emergency. So um, while it's important to keep our city's budget in check, uh, when we make promises to people that we depend on to keep us safe, we need to keep those promises. And, um, and I think that's a very, very key part to any pension reform. Okay, we'll leave that subject for now. There are a number of um, specific issues, and I'm just kind of going through for information, and then we'll go back to some of the bigger ones, okay? And I believe Ms. Benson, this is yours first. And these are um, just various issues going on. You may or may not have experience with them, either one of you, so we'll see. The first one is about the Marquette Pool. The Marquette Pool is important to the youth in this area. When will it reopen? That's a good question. As far as I know, as a resident of the 20th Ward, I wasn't even aware that it was closing this last year. It was a huge disappointment to me. I know my son and I went to the pool almost every other weekend. And many, many children around here depended on that as one of their only places to play in the summertime. Uh, I don't know when it plans to reopen, but I have been working with the president of our board of aldermen, Lewis Reedy, uh, to make sure that it's included in the bond issue so that we can put the money necessary to the renovation of, of the pool so that we can reopen it. It's, a, it's one of three public open pools in the city of St. Louis. We're incredibly lucky to have it in the 20th Ward, 
and I think we need to prioritize reopening it. And certainly, if anything, if any pool or any public facility ever plans to close, I think it should be a priority of our aldermen to let us know beforehand and why, why it's closed. Well, I don't know who all has the ability to start uh, working on bond issues other than the Board of Aldermen, and that's what we're doing. And I have uh, tried to work with the President of the Board of Aldermen and others to put that pool in, as well as O'Fallon's pool. The pool was done in 1958. Uh, they didn't ask me to close the pool. It collapsed. The pipes collapsed. So I put together a committee to try to look for additional funding in addition to the uh, bond issue. Uh, representative of the Urban League, the Strong City, Strong Communities, which tries to cut through the red tape uh, with the federal government, a representative from the mayor's office, an individual who has done uh, work with other uh, public pools, who is now with Better Together, a man by the name of Wilson, uh, representative from the Board of Aldermen, and we're going to continue to look for additional funding to do this. The amount of money is about $3 million. Um, so that doesn't come very easily. I've tried to put together some monies that might be available to put in as a match to try to do that. So we don't know how quickly that will happen, but it's a priority. Okay, thank you. This one is about um, the street plan. for planning the city streets for changing that plan of city streets. And I think Mr. Schmidt first. Okay, so basically we have an old city and a lot of this infrastructure has been around for a long time. The street administrator is responsible for the way that the sidewalk and the street layouts and so forth are. However, you as residents, constituents of the various wards also have a say so. So individuals do do petitions from time to time, uh, and those are considered by the older people and they're also considered by the, the street administrator. We have over time, because uh, folks have been concerned about various issues in their community, had a number of uh, streets that are going one way in various ways. So my intent is, um, after April, is to come back and work with the street administrator to look at all those and kind of have a reasonable plan to look at those with the residents to make sure that the whole plan makes sense. Each individual one makes sense, but sometimes, taken collectively, they don't all make sense, so that's the question of I'm assuming most of you all go here or buy here, because you can't get very cold outside today. I know I drove here, um, and any, as, as with any time I drive in the 20th Ward, I end up extremely frustrated with these one-way streets. They are everywhere. They prevent us from getting anywhere efficiently, effectively. It is completely ridiculous how this ward, the streets are laid out down here. And I know that individuals who live on streets have had input and asked for one-way streets to be put in. And in some cases, that might make sense. But in general, this ward's road structure is completely insane. Nobody likes driving through the 20th Ward. I don't like driving through the 20th Ward. I have hated canvassing specifically because the roads are one way facing each other, going every other way. I can't imagine how this could possibly be good for anybody. There's study after study that show that one-way streets decrease home values, increase crime and increase speed that people travel. So thank you. 